Awesome. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Beth Lewis here with Save Our Schools Arizona. I'm a local teacher and one of the co-founders of our grassroots group all around the state committed to um, community engagement and voter outreach around the importance of public education here in Arizona. And I am so excited to be here today with G2 Brown. G2 and I met Man, that was about two years ago in Indianapolis, and he is an amazing person and organizer. And Chichu, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, okay. Well, Beth, it's good to see you again, and I'm I'm honored uh, that you all were asked me to present to your powerful network. Uh, my name is G Two Brown. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm sitting on my back porch, which transformed to my COVID office. So um, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. Uh, I am, I've been a community organizer most of my adult life uh, since I've been 25, I'm 54. And um, I, uh, for many years, was the education organizer at Chicago's oldest Black-led uh, grassroots organizer group, which is called the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. I always call myself a proud son of COCO, that's our acronym. Uh, today, uh, really since 2012, I've served as the National Director of the Journey for Justice Alliance. We are an alliance of grassroots, uh, community-based organizations in over 36 cities around the country and growing. We started with 12 cities. Um, we are committed to using community organizing to win equity in public education. Um, our biggest issue is that, uh, is that we understand that the problem in public education is not bad teachers, it's not disinterested inner city children, it's, it's not uh, disengaged parents. The biggest issue in public education in the United States and in many places around the world is the lack of equity for black, brown, and indigenous children. And that we cannot take our eye off the prize. We cannot allow systems that are generally uh, organized to oppress our communities to define what our issues are, to shape uh, how we, the lens in which we see the education world and the greater world around us. Um, we're in a really critical time right now um, with the emergence of COVID. Just as healthcare disparities have been exposed, these disparities that are centuries old um, have been exposed during COVID. To give you an example, uh, Black people in the city of Chicago, uh, roughly 31% of the population. Um, and for many uh, uh, months, we were, it was 70% of the COVID deaths. Um, in places like St. Louis, Missouri, everyone that has passed from COVID have been, uh, been Black people. And why? Because our folks go to the hospital, they're not believed. <clears throat> the hospitals that are in our communities are often starved and don't have the resources to meet the needs of the, the communities that they serve. And by the same token, our schools are often underfunded. And even when they do have funding, because of the lens in which our children are seen, uh, our children are often criminalized, our children don't have culturally relevant and, comp culturally relevant, um, and responsive curriculum. Um, even if the colonial education flies in the face of the children's right to dignity, um, as happened in Arizona with the, um, with the efforts at getting um, ethnic studies, um, those that are in decision-making authority only see the world through their lens. And so they try to force us to choke down the miseducation that's often fed to our communities. What we see at this moment during COVID um, and after the, 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 the lynching of George Floyd, there was a moment that happened in this country that I think is a terrible moment, but it's also an inspiring moment. Everyone, because we couldn't go outside, we couldn't go to work. We were forced to sit there and watch this man delight as he snatched the life of from George Floyd. Uh, information came out afterwards that these men worked together, that they were bouncers in the same place, and that this gentleman had issues with black people, uh, with black men in particular. But when we watched this happen to George Floyd, it's, it, 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 it struck at all of our sense of humanity. And it made those, those of us that even were, were unknowing 
or unwilling to know confront the realities of what America really is. There are a lot of great things about living in America. I'm porch of my house. I was able to purchase a home with my wife. And um, of course, there are luxuries that we, we, we um, have that other countries don't. That does not mean that we are free. Um, the question has to be, are we free or are we just complacent slaves to uh, an interest that doesn't serve any of our communities, whether you are low income, middle income, black, indigenous, white, brown, that the intention of this system is to make all of us spokes in a wheel. And that wheel turn, we don't determine how that wheel turns. But what's happening is that people are saying, no, we, we want to drive our own car. Like if we pay taxes, we have a right to be treated with dignity and respect. What are you doing with all the money that you take from us every day? What are you doing when um, we kiss our babies and we send them to school with the expectation that those schools will provide for our children the opportunity to stand on our shoulders? What, why is that not happening? And so what parents and community members and educators are starting to say now is that do you think we actually trust the same system that's telling people to ingest bleach to deal with COVID, that's telling people that masks don't work and Herman Cain just, just died and we saw him at an indoor rally for, for, for President Trump? Um, do we actually believe that these people are fit to determine whether our ch how in what state our children should return to school, what conditions? Right. Um, our children should return to school. So we say the only way that schools are gonna open equity, if, we, if we're taking a real, honest, political analysis of the people that are in leadership and whether we, we matter to them or not, honest assessment of that, then we, are, we, we, have to, we have to come to this conclusion. The only way schools will open safely and equitably is if we make it so. And just because they say something does not mean that's what it is. There's an old saying, people do what you let them do. So for us, what we're realizing now is that this cannot be a situation where we do a rally, we go speak to our legislators, accept whatever decision they make. No, because our children's lives, our educators' lives, our janitors, our school staff's lives are at stake. And beyond that, Whenever school returns, it cannot go back to the old, same old, same old. It has to become an equitable school system. We will accept nothing less. So that's my, my, my opening tirade. And so any questions or any other questions you got, Beth, I'm, I'm open to it. No, spot on. I, we've been fighting the same battles here in Arizona that I know you've been fighting for decades in Chicago. And, you know, I've, I've heard you present. I know that our battles are very similar here in Arizona. Um, we have the most inequitable funding in the entire country. Absolutely. There was a report that came out that by the Ed Build Foundation that remember the 23 billion report last year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. said $23 billion less in funding are spent on non-white districts across the state than white districts. And in Arizona, we're by far the first offender. So, you know, Save That's Our Schools has been trying to work with, with lawmakers to put pressure for more equitable funding. And we really have quite the reverse in Arizona. And every single year, there's a new privatization scheme, a new, you know, for-profit charter model, a new voucher scheme that get, funnels more and more money towards our white affluent suburban communities and less and less money towards the kids who need the most resources. And we're seeing it you know, the, opportuni uh, the opportunists are circling right now, trying to push Absolutely. that through because of the pandemic. And we're trying to say exactly what you said, no more of the inequity. Our kids need to be held safe, right? Their safety needs to be prioritized. And, you know, a lot of people, I don't know if you've seen this in Chicago, but a lot of people have said, well, you know, we need to open our schools because of the social emotional health of our kids and because our black and brown families need the supports of school and you know we've kind of answered <laughs> to be honest when did you care about those families and when That's did right. you care about their social emotional learning Teacher. so 
I'd love to hear more. I mean, I guess there are so many things to talk about. Yes, ma'am. Um, one thing, I want to hear a little bit about your journey um, as you create a journey for justice. Like, what's maybe the, the story? And I know that you've done some work around dismantling the privatization schemes that lead to such inequities. Uh, maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am. So, um, as I stated, I was the education organizer with the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, um, led by a dynamic, at that time, community organizer named Jay Travis. And um, she taught me a lot about, um, you know, strategy and organizing. And so uh, working with her, we had formed, we had formed a, uh, the first national coalition that I was a part of called uh, SEPS, Communities for Excellent Public Schools. SEPs made, you know, that's how I began to build relationships with organizers around the country. Uh, and eventually SEPs folded due to lack of funding support. Um, and we all went back to our local communities. And I began to get phone calls, one in particular from Zakia Ansari from um, the Alliance for Quality Education in New York. And she told me, she said, G2, I, I feel all alone. I feel isolated. And I said, I do too. Because often when you are in cities, uh, working with the populations of working class and low income black and brown families and indigenous families, you know, say that you deserve to get treated with respect and dignity brings the fury of that system against you. And so um, you're often isolated with your members uh, and with your core key group of supporters, but you're still up against the city, the state, the corporate interests um, that uh demonize you and and make it as if you're wrong for saying get your foot off my neck and so we began having conversations uh as i said j4j started with 12 cities uh, we began to have conversations and, and of course as you said different locations same game we were realizing that no one was address, addressing the inequity like in the city of chicago three million people um, Chicago is, is a hyper-segregated city. So black people live on the south side and the west side. White people live on the north side, far southwest side, right? And, and uh, uh, Mexican families live on the near west side, on the, the lower part of the south and far, far southeast, et cetera, et cetera. So you could look at how institutions function in those different communities to see that there was an effort to make sure that beautiful babies that were white in a, not, not just affluent, in middle class communities received a completely different reality in regards to public education than children on the south and west sides. And that, that was, we were just supposed to accept that's how it is. For example, if we, we define education as inspiration and information that prepare a people to make their way in the world to positively impact the world. That inspiration comes first. Uh, any educator will tell you that the most beautiful moment in a child's education is not when they regurgitate information that you've given them, but it's those moments of self-discovery. It's when a child realizes they can do more than they thought that they can do. When they problem solve, right? When they learn to work together in groups, those are the moments for educators that are the most rewarding. But if you deny opportunities for inspiration, like no art, no music, no world language, no small class sizes, no opportunities for project-based learning, um, no opportunities to travel, to see things, right? Like I've been blessed as an organizer to, ha I, I, I had incredible mentors. So I've traveled this planet. I've been in Ecuador, I've been in Africa, I've been all over the world as a guy from the Chicago, uh, I've met people from Brazil that look just like me. That I, and I realized, wait a minute, I'm not a minority. I mean, Brazil is 85% black. People, you know, but these things are never shared with us. Like the only reason I speak English is because the people that stole my ancestors spoke English. Just like the reason why people in Portugal speak Portuguese is because the people that stole their ancestors spoke Portuguese. So if children are denied that opportunity for inspiration, then there is no education process. And so we, we, we understood that, that there was a need for us 
since we had these common stories from different places to come together. So our first action was actually in 2013, and uh, we came together at an education conference in Chicago, and 12 cities filed Title VI civil rights complaints around school closings and the The, the disparate impact that it had on black communities. And we, we got national news right off the bat. Arnie Duncan, right? And our first victory was people may remember that there was a situation where uh, race to the top was the law of the land. And in order for states to give money, they had to apply for school improvement grants, which, deter which moved districts towards privatization. The only way you can get federal money is if you agree to school closings, charter schools, contract schools, turnaround models, right? And so our first victory was we chased Arnie Duncan around the country and made him uh, add a fifth option which was for evidence-based whole school models, which is translated to sustainable community schools. And we want about $150 million put in that pot to make sure that states could actually begin to expand the community school model as a optimization model. That let us know something. And we began this alliance. Um, and, and, and in the beginning, we were fighting against school closings. We knew that in order for us to, to grow into a movement and build a movement, it couldn't just be what we were against. It had to be what we were for. And so we began to develop our platform. Folks can go to our website, www.j4jalliance.com. You can see our platform called for uh, 25,000 sustainable community schools by 2025, elimination of punitive standardized testing, why is that point important? Uh, w, the great, late great W.B. Du Bois uh, said in 1940 that standardized testing was all about eugenics, proving the false narrative of awareness. So my question is, if, if this ancestor understood that some nearly 85 years, 80, at this point, 80, over 80 years ago, it's inexcusable that we're still using that metric today to determine students' growth. So people can see our platform um, and we began to grow. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I don't wanna belabor you with a, a lot of uh, details, but I would just say that we've grown to 36 cities, um, that um, we are have been a major part of spreading sustainable community schools around the country defeating privatization efforts. Um, and we know that the only way we can do this is through community organizing. Community organizing and activism are not the same. They're different. They're both valuable. But an activist picks their issue and raises their voice to address that issue. An organizer works with the people directly impacted by an issue to build strategy and power so that they can lift their voices, right? And so Journey for Justice Alliance is made up of community organizing groups because we know that the only way to beat money power is people power. It's not by electing a so-called progressive billionaire in office, right? That's what some people have done. Here in Illinois, uh, we have Bruce Rauner, a Republican, probably on the list of worst governors in the history of the United States. He's on that list. Um, He's, he closed neighborhood schools and put charter schools up in black communities with his name on it, right? Um, and so what people did in Illinois is they went and found a billionaire that professed to be progressive. Uh, so our, our um, mayor now is, is a man named J.B. Pritzker. Pritzker comes from the uh, Hyatt Hotel family. So his grandchildren are not going to have to work, right? Uh, his sister was on the school board in Chicago and unanimously voted to close schools. So how progressive are they really, right? No, the way that we uh, speak power to power is by good old fashioned community organizing. The reason why Beth can sit on this platform and I can sit on this platform as a woman and as, as, as a black man and lead organizations, um, go get on an airplane and nobody stop us because of the color of our skin, apply for loans and be able to get those loans. Every right that we have in this country is a direct result of community organizing. Our position 
is that we have become an unconscious constituency. We actually look at elected officials as our leaders instead of just representatives that are supposed to carry out our will. And so we have to revitalize the notion of community organizing in our cities. Again, become a conscious constituency, recognize that we carry wisdom and carry expertise. I don't care if you a mother that doesn't have a, a high school diploma and you sell candy in front of your house as your hustle. I don't care what it is. We all have something to offer. If you pay taxes, I don't care if you're paying a mortgage. I don't care if you're paying a car note. I don't care if you're buying a bag of potato chips. If you pay taxes, you have a right to demand a reasonable return on your investment, right? From the system that is supposed to represent you. So it is our job to make America better, not to settle for the scraps that corporate interests try to give us. So J for J, um, I'm proud to say that um, Elizabeth Warren would not have called for 25,000 sustainable community schools without J for J. That was our move. To move Bernie Sanders further to the left on education was an effort that J for J undertook. So um, our alliance is powerful. And I'm using the word alliance and not coalition for a reason. A coalition is often a temporary arrangement around a particular issue, right? So we want to get a stop sign put up. We want to get better food for our this school or at schools, period. So people who come from different places agree on that issue. An alliance is a group of people to come together around a common set of values, beliefs that govern your behavior. And so we're very clear that we are not a coalition. We are an alliance. Uh, and what's happening now is that we enter through the lens of education, but we're starting to work with groups outside of education to be able, we're starting to work with groups outside of education to be able to say that our fight is for a quality of life agenda because policing is an issue. Racism is like a virus that we are all afflicted with and it infects every quality of life institution that's supposed to serve the public, whether it's education, whether it's housing, healthcare, food production and delivery systems, economic development, youth investment, the right of our seniors, whatever you look at, racism infects it because it is the one issue that America has never confronted in an honest uh, uh, and determined way. So that, that's sort of how we got started and also a little bit about sort of where, how we're starting to move forward. Thank you. It's so powerful to hear those stories. And I think it gives us all hope. I mean, we're all organizing in communities here in Arizona, but it's tough. I mean, to be perfectly honest, everything you've described, the corporate interests, the privatizers have really kind of torn apart at that concept of community schools in Arizona. Mm. But they've taken root for 20 years. And so what we've got, uh, we've got open enrollment, so people kind of pluck their kids all around, and they're not mm -hmm. going to their community school anymore. Then we've got all, like, this huge proliferation of for-profit charter schools that kind of have the same impact. Then we've got private school vouchers that grow and grow every single year. And so once you start to chip away at that notion of a community school, it's hard to bring everybody back. And you and I both know, like, as organizers and as as parents and people working in the community, like when there aren't all those options, you band together with your neighbors and you fight for better, right? That's and right. you say, you know what? We don't have to agree on everything, but we agree that our kids deserve an amazing school right here in our community. And like you said, they deserve band, they deserve art, they deserve everything that every other kid in the state has. And we've kind of walked away from that here in Arizona a bit. Yes, and a lot of it is because, you know, Betsy DeVos, her group, American Federation for Children, and some other groups have spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to, you know, put out all of these like fancy marketing and, and people have really bought into this notion of school choice in Arizona when we know that it's not it's not that simple, right? There's a lot of discrimination. There's a lot of inequity around that. And it's really kind of the school's choice. And yeah. we don't have that sense of community schools here in, in a lot of places. And I guess I'd love some advice um, about how we can get back to that and maybe just 
if you could talk about the importance of community schools from your perspective too. Yes, ma'am. So no, I appreciate that question. So the first thing I wanna say um, is that we're very clear that school choice is a scam, that there could be no choice without stability. And so if the school district throws a grenade in my neighborhood school, right? And the, and the mother grabs her baby and, and runs and then there's, there's uh, this shiny charter school the floors are buffed and every child gets an iPad, right? That's not choice, right? The choice of a world-class school within safe walking distance of my home was taken from me, right? By the sabotage of my neighborhood school. So Arizona's you know, sister is really no different than everywhere else. I tell people, all, I've met with people and they'll say, well, we're not in the streets like y'all are in Chicago. People don't want, I said, no, no, no. People are, we are all conditioned to believe that we are, that we're conditioned to believe that we can't win. Everything we see teaches us we can't win. The responsibility of the organizer is to create those alternative environments where you come with a completely different narrative. So my experience with that was, because remember that we, I, I live in the city where Rahm Emanuel, a Democrat, closed 50 schools at one time with the stroke of a pen, right? And the violence in Chicago as a result. Um, so I'll tell you what we, we did. I, I, I worked for, I've, since I've been in this work, I've worked in a community called Bronzeville, used to live in Bronzeville. Bronzeville is a historic black community on the south side of Chicago, um, 10 minutes from downtown Chicago, right off the lakefront. So if you could say gentrify, you know what that means, right? Prime real estate. We, I sat on the local school council. Chicago has LSCs, local school councils. Very powerful local decision-making bodies made up of six parents, two teachers, two community representatives, school staff, the principal, and at high school, uh, the student. There's a student seat on a high school level. We elect local school councils. We can, we get, we, we hire the principal, give them a four year contract, and we can actually remove the principal. Very powerful body. Here's the sabotage. Our school board is elected. I mean, our school board is appointed, I'm sorry. And so since we have mayoral control, the school board has the real power. So if they come with horrible policies, the LSCs are powerless to stop them, right? So here's a secret, and you got it from me, all right? The secret weapon that we have, Beth, is that no one goes to black, brown, indigenous, and working class families and asks them, what do you think and mean it? Now, as simple, I, I, want, I want people to reflect on what I just said. Nobody goes to the mother who works at Walmart or the mother that works at the liquor store or the father who uh, drives and says, what do you think housing should look like in your community? What do you think healthcare should look like? And mean it, and by mean it, I mean, take what, they, what they've offered, create a plan, bring them in, get feedback, respond to their feedback, and then move with them to change it. So what I had to do, I sat on the local school council of a school called Diet High School on the south side of Chicago. I sat on that local school council for 10 years. In 2008, we had the largest decrease of students, our largest, I'm sorry, the largest increase of students going to college in all of Chicago public schools. In 2008, 2009, we had the largest decrease in arrests and suspensions. We had a nationally recognized restorative justice program. Our students went around the country training people in restorative justice. In 2011, we won the ESPN Rise Up Award. Uh, we beat out over 600 schools around the country. As a small school doing great things, we got a $4 million in, uh, uh, transformation of our athletic facilities. And the next year, they voted to close our school. Right. So what we saw the writing on the wall because they were starting to disinvest in a lot of the programs that we had created at Diet that were working, like Avid, um, the mentorship programs for young women and young men that we had created. So as 
an organizer, I began meeting with parents at the feeder schools and the parents at diet and the students to engage them in six pillars. Curriculum that's relevant, engaging, and challenging. Supports for high quality teaching, not high stakes testing. Wraparound supports for every child. What does a student-centered school climate look like? Transformative parent and community engagement. What does transformative parent and community engagement look like? And the sixth pillar was what does inclusive school leadership look like? So for example, a principal that thinks that PhDs should not have to talk to GEDs is not fit to run a community school, right? And so we, I talked to about 5,000 people and we built a plan for Diet High School for what we call a sustainable community school village. It was a plan that connected Diet to six feeder schools. It had a vertical curriculum alignment, culturally relevant and responsive curriculum, using the school garden that was at Diet, a student-ran school garden as part of the science curriculum plan. The American Education Research Association said it's the best plan they'd ever seen. And what happened in the same type of low-income community is because we engaged people with respect and we took their input and they saw that their input was reflected in our plan. Those people said, I'll come. We're going to meet with the mayor. I'll, I'll go. We're doing a rally in front of Diet on this day. I'll be there. We need people to call the mayor's office. I'll call. Will you? We, we want to send the mayor a thousand postcards in support of our plan. Yes, I'll do that, baby. I might not be at a march, but I can do that. And so we engaged an entire community against one of them who because they were they were committed to closing diet. All the rhetoric that they used, diet score, test scores, um, lower enrollment at the school. We got to do something for the kids. Just like people are saying now, we have to put children in school. Children, but where have they demonstrated any care and concern for these children in the past? right the reason diet transformed is because we made it transform right those children knew we valued them i was at that school every day right i, I moved my office to inside the school so they so every day i saw those children i took those children to flint michigan and we did we did service projects took them on college tours they knew they were valued here's what happened we demanded that diet doesn't because they were phasing the school out which means they would not allow freshmen and so each grade would just matriculate until there were no more children in the school we demanded that our plan get accepted uh we began to target the mayor because he was the power broker and the alderman in our district as a secondary target because we knew that he can go to the mayor and say please boss get these people off me <laughs> right and so what happened is we went to war with Rahm Emanuel over this school, but not just this school, the again, building what we call a pre-K through 12 system of education in our neighborhood. They, he finally said, after we, we broke up some of his press conferences, can you imagine Rahm Emanuel, if people remember, one of the most powerful Democrats in the United States, former chief of staff for Mayor Rahm Emanuel, I mean, for, uh, for, for President Obama, uh, uh, congressman out of the state of illinois investment banker his brother a hollywood agent so he was the fundraiser for B bill clinton he's a fundraiser for hillary clinton so this power broker this was not just some you know bogus elected official and people didn't want to fight him we fought him uh to the point where we would go at his press conferences and we would just unfurl a huge save diet uh plan in front of his press conference we would bird dog him, which means we would follow him everywhere he went. Uh, we would we chained ourselves to the statue outside of the mayor's office, right outside of his office. Um, we did a three day sit in at the at Chicago Public Schools, and what happened is we began to get publicity around our, our plan. And as people began to vet, well, are these people that just want to get a charter school and get paid? Nope. Uh, is this plan any good? Oh, it's excellent. Um, are these actually the people directly impacted? These are mothers at the feeder schools. These are students. These are parents. These are people who live in the neighborhood. So as the plan got more respect and we got more visibility, the question began to be raised with parents all around the city of Chicago, white parents as well. Why do these people have to go through all of this? And I don't. Why do they have to go through these lengths? But we had 
deep support because of how we engaged people. And then um, as we began to engage in uh, government, uh, whether it was the alderman, whether it was the mayor, uh, kept slamming the door in our face, my members, our sense of outrage began to grow. And the sense of outrage began to grow. Not my outrage, their outrage. They began to say they're willing to do more because they believed in the plan that they created. Their plan was created out of love. And so they knew that this was in the best interest of their children. So what ended up happening is as we escalated, we began to talk about the idea of a hunger strike. Now, if folks can't see me, I'm six foot three, about 320 pounds. I like to eat, right? So the notion of a hunger strike demonstrated the commitment that people had to this notion of equitable education. So what happened is that um, Rahm Emanuel came up with, the Chicago Public Schools came up with a process. They invited other people to, to bring proposals. We packed town hall meetings, it was clear that our proposal was far superior, then they reneged on their own process. Now we had begun planning six months before that we might have to go this route. So we talked to people that had done hunger strikes in the past, they mentored us so that we understood what we were walking into. So on August, after they reneged, on August 17th, 2015, we launched the hunger strike to save Diet High School. We stayed on that hunger strike for 34 days. I wanna announce, to your listeners that on September 24th, we won. Diet was voted to be reopened as an open enrollment neighborhood school, as a sustainable community school. And most of the things that we demanded in the curriculum are in place today with $16 million in new investments. In a city as segregated and politically cutthroat as Chicago, that was a monumental victory for education justice. And so what we did, after that is we took those hunger strikers and they began to speak all over the country and the notion of sustainable community schools began to spread newark new jersey oakland california other pla uh, other places uh, new york city uh, cincinnati ohio other places around the country began to dive into this model that was evidence-based uh, dr linda uh, linda darling hammond uh did a study on it on our model and said that this model is working it is outpacing is, is work is it's outpacing charter schools and traditional public schools as an evidence-based model of school improvement. The, if it was not for the fight for Diet High School, there would have been no proposal to take to Elizabeth Warren. And, and she would not have accepted 25,000 sustainable community schools on her education platform. Bernie Sanders would not have committed 500 million for the funding of sustainable community schools if it was not for that. And if folks remember, Bernie Sanders, love him, but he was not on the right side of education justice in 2016. Um, so what I'm sharing with you is the way to uh, combat those forces is you have to get with the people not getting with the people, telling them what their agenda is, but asking them. So when I met with parents, of course, the average mother is not versed on, on what wraparound supports for every child looks like. So I had to go to them and I had to say, you know, Miss Jones, if you could dream, what would you want for your baby? And because a lot of the response I got, and you're going to get it too, and you probably have is those people aren't gonna let us do anything. They're gonna do what they're gonna do anyway. That's cold for I don't believe. That's all that means. Because there's been no examples of me winning. So what are you talking about? So when I did that, I asked those questions. As they talked, my understanding of the six pillars of sustainable community schools, I started in those different categories. Flush, we flushed it out together. Uh, parents were giving me brilliant ideas like, um, making the student garden part of the science curriculum, coming up with a parent-led social activities committee for young people. They were tired of young people going to the same uh, field trips every year. Um, life entrepreneurship taught fourth through eighth grade in black communities uh, to reinvigorate those black economic corridors that we used to have in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that have disappeared now. And in most black communities, we own very little of it, right? So that wisdom came from the people. So 
what happened is that because they were heard, they were willing to fight. People will fight for what they helped to build. We don't want buy-in. The work is to get input, to, to allow people's lived experience to shape what we develop. And so the fight for diet high school was a microcosm of what should happen around the country. Because in Chicago, white mothers from, Ed, from, from, from Lincoln Park and from all over the city, they were confronted with the reality of looking at a woman their age sitting on the floor in City Hall being picked up by police because all she wanted was an equitable education for a baby. So those women in, in their, you know, singing their praises, they were honest about what they were seeing. They were honest. And then they, they got on the battlefield with us. So something happened during a hunger strike I want to share with you all. In the same city, where John Burge tortured black men, where he put electrical cables, excuse how graphic this is gonna be. When they tortured black men into, they would put electric cables on men's testicles to make them confess to crimes they didn't commit. In the same city where Richard Daly said during the Democratic National Convention, shoot to kill, in the same city where children went into what were not educated in, in school buildings, they were educated in trailers called the Willis Wagons, black children. I was one of those babies at Bennett Elementary School. I went to school in trailers as a child. So in the same city, during a budget hearing, where Rahm Emanuel, so dismissive of us, held public forums while we were starving in Washington Park, 700 people attended that, that, that hearing and they stormed the stage. They stormed the stage against one of the most powerful Democrats in the country. His security literally picked him up and, and carried him out because the people were ready to overthrow him. And it started with honest, unsexy, very real engagement of the people directly impacted. So that's our secret weapon. And, and, and so I believe, you know, Beth, that that is the way that we build the momentum around our vision for what public schools need to look like. There's movement in Chicago now calling for Chicago to become a sustainable community school district. Chicago is as racist as any city. As I said in the beginning, 30% of the population, 70% of the COVID deaths. And just yesterday, in the middle of this, they announced that one of Chicago's oldest hospitals, Mercy Hospital, where I was born, right? Right on the edge of Bronzeville is closing. How can you close a hospital when COVID has shown you the disparities? So in the memory of all those people who lost their lives, the government should be making an all out commitment to fund black hospitals to make sure they can meet the needs of their constituents, but they're not. So what I'm saying to you all, is that racism is everywhere, but organizing can reach anyone. Not activism, organizing can reach anyone. Um, so that's um, how we're fighting, right? And I'm not trying to present a, a rosy picture like you're never gonna lose. You're gonna lose some battles. I've lost battles. There's schools that I fought to save, uh, that I was a part of fighting to save that are closed. In my neighborhood, we didn't win that fight. You're not going to win every fight, but the but you will ultimately win if you organize and recognize that this cannot be in a state of emergency. For America to change, we have to build organizing as a culture. Um, in some societies, when they were fighting colonial forces, they called it warrior culture. Everybody's a warrior. Women, men children. Being a warrior is not about your ethnicity. It's not about your gender. It's about your spirit. It's about what moves you, right? But one of the greatest community organizers I ever met was Jay Travis. Uh, if you saw her, looks like she can model in any magazine, right? But she's a warrior. She's a, I mean, she, she walks with drums beating in her spirit. And so I learned that as a man from her because I had to watch her and realize this woman's serious. And she's, she's brilliant. And so from that, I grew as an organizer from that lesson. 
So we have to understand this is not about rising up in crisis. This is about recognizing that we have not, uh, that, that as a public, let me say this, as a public, we have accepted being an unconscious constituency and we see where that's gotten us. So we have to change in order to change this system. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I completely agree. And I think, you know, this has been a little bit of a dose of Saturday morning inspiration for me, for sure. I think here in Arizona, we're, I'll speak for teachers and parents, I think we're feeling pretty abandoned by our elected officials. Um, we've, we've had a lot of struggles. And, you know, I think we're starting to realize that at the city level, at the school board level, at the at the state level, local lawmakers, our governor, like nobody cares about the people and it can be really frustrating, but yes, talking to you, I mean, I, I think I've seen the power of community organizing here. I've seen the power of parents standing up and saying, not our kids. And, you know, I think we have so much more work to do here in Arizona and in every community and getting the right voices to be heard, right? Not just yeah. the same voices over and over and elevating those powerful stories and doing all of the work that you described is just, I mean, it's incredibly inspiring. And yeah. I got to hold out hope, you know, I believe in our public schools, as I know you do. I believe that they can improve. I, we try not to sugarcoat things and say that our public schools are perfect. We know that we have a long way to go, but they are, you know, they're also the fabric of our communities and they're worth fighting for. And Yes, ma'am. And I, I will say this to you, Beth, that you're not alone. Um, SOS Arizona is not alone. Um, I want to recommend that we begin conversations about you all joining the j for j family. Um, because um, hopelessness, um, I think hopelessness festers in isolation, right? When you feel like you're by yourself. And... Um, but if our if we share a common love for children and a common love for humanity, then we have to realize that we have all been trained to see the world through our oppressor's lens. We have to be, I'm going to go back to George Floyd. There are many people before George Floyd who thought that Black people were just complaining, that believed a lot of the stereotypes that Black people don't want to work, even though we, we helped build this country. We've shown more grace to evil than anybody other than Native Americans, right? And uh, shoot, I'm the son of a steel worker. My father used to come home, God bless his soul, Milton Brown, my father used to come home with burns on his arms because he was a machinist at Wisconsin Steel and had a ninth grade education. And I saw when the steel industry collapsed, my father changed oil. He worked at a gas station. He fixed people's cars. He did. And I used to go with him as an 11 or 12 year old. I would see how tired my father was. The, working hard has nothing to do with your race, right? We have to understand that those that oppressed us have always stood on the necks of those who they exploit. So the, the you know, if you're talking about the building of this country and you're talking about what was done to Mexican families in Texas, or you're talking about what was done to Chinese families in California, building America's railroads, to black families on the West Coast, and then when they wanted to bring in white immigrants, they used even organized labor. They used uh, uh, labor, uh, political leaders, police would beat and kill us to remove us from those jobs to make way for working class white people. That's America's history and it's the truth, right? So we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing to lower our heads for. We have to demand a different world. And, we, and if 12 low income mothers can beat one of the most powerful Democrats in the country and his corporate forces, if we could do that, we could do anything. Those examples are supposed to, to, to give us examples of what's possible, right? Not um, to dismiss it as an outlier. No, these are things that can happen. This world can change. This world can change. The, you're looking right now at policing being forced to change. Now, the establishment has circled the wagons because they feel the threat. 
So they circled the wagons and they're fighting and they're fighting back. But, but there's an old saying, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win, right? And so victory is upon us. We, we, and we have to do something else. On August 3rd, we're, we're, we're having a national day of action uh, and we're calling uh, this equity or else. Equity or else. We are not gonna continue to invest in systems that oppress our communities. We're not gonna continue to allow people to get bloated off our misery. Again, if we pay taxes, we have a right to a reasonable investment. So in 36 cities around the country, we're hitting the streets and we're calling for the safe and equitable return to public schools. I don't know if you all um, can show the, um, the letter. Um, we've penned an open letter to Donald Trump uh, and that, that is being mailed to Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and every member of Congress on Monday. We're saying, if these demands are not met, keep our children at home. Educators, if these demands are not met, don't go to work. Because if we do, then that's complicity. We are complicit with a plan that we know that, 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 that does not value our young people. How often do you hear these people lament over the 150,000 people that have died? Over 150,000 people gone. Mothers, children, fathers, grandparents. Their stories matter. Their lives matter. They have to matter to us. So those people, I'm going to say, I said this on an interview this morning, those people that are fighting uh, to, to force our children into school in the fall, those people that are peddling misinformation, we have to stop acting like they're leaders, they're buffoons, right? I'm wondering when will the president or when will the media at a press briefing just some of stand up together, tell him to shut the F up, turn around and walk out. Why do we keep treating this man as if he's our leader? He's not. Why do we keep, why do we keep treating these people that are telling, that are going to rallies with no mask and popping up with COVID? People that are, um, that are telling you to ingest bleach. Why are we treating them as if they're competent? They're not. And until we have the courage to say that we're the people we've been waiting for, we are the leaders we've been waiting for, and we begin to work together. So that's what we're saying on August 3rd, equity or else, um, over 36, 36 cities around the country, and there'll be follow-up actions after that. And we're also beginning to go at corporations and, and insurance companies and banks that have profited off the misery of Black... Do you, do you know that Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Chase Bank used to uh, uh, give loans to slave owners that used their slaves as collateral. And there's never been any accountability. So they got bloated off the destruction of the lives of my ancestors. Do you know that AIG Insurance used to take insurance, and other insurance companies to take insurance policies out on slaves? on people in captivity, when they took those insurance policies out, the average expectancy on the, on the slave plantation was seven years. So after they worked my ancestors to death, they just filed a claim and no accountability. Those days are over. Those days are over. And we say that for Native American communities, where they've taken everything, they've murdered over 100 million people, and crying about changing the name of a baseball team where people in, in Standing Rock said, we just want a place where we can respect our ancestral burial ground. And they drilled anyway. They took everything from these sisters and brothers. When will that stop being acceptable to us? Because to me, it's not acceptable. And these people don't speak for me. And they don't speak for your folk either. And so that's the moment we in, sisters and brothers. That's the moment we in. Listen. What we're they gonna can always talk. 
let me say this. They can always target a Cesar Chavez. They can always target a, De a Dolores Huerta. They can always target a Malcolm X. They can always target a Fannie Lou Hamer. But they can't target a thousand of them. They can't target a million of them. Those men and women were simply an example of what we could be if we're serious. They're no better, no, be no better than any of us. They were flawed as we all are. But at the end of the day, we must stop being sheep and we must roar like the lions that we really are. And that's what timing is. Yes, ma'am. That is what time it is. And I think Arizona is ready to join you. I think, um, I know that our tech support put all of the links into the Facebook Live so we can make sure to get people to sign on to those letters to Trump and Biden and local officials. Um, we're glad to join you in that fight. We've been working really hard organizing to push back the to delay the start of school and to ensure a healthy safe equitable return back to school and, and those efforts have been largely successful um you know our governor punted to local school districts and so we've worked with districts all around the state and have just tried to apply that pressure but like i think everything you've said we just shouldn't have to fight this hard so we're so grateful for your time your words of inspiration your fight. I think everybody who's listening to this conversation is probably much more geared up for the fight ahead. So thank you. Um, I hope we get to see each other at the Network for Public Education whenever we can reschedule for that. I can't wait to give you a big hug and thank you for all your work. So Likewise. we appreciate you. Likewise. And thank you so much, you two. And stay in touch. Let's talk yes, about more adding um, SOS to Journey for Justice and I'm going to sign off to stop the live stream and, and yes, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.